And, and then when people step up and, and buy into this idea that they are in charge of their thoughts and feelings, because really we are the only ones that can think for ourselves. No one can think for us. Nobody can feel for us. And when we become conscious of what we're thinking about and how we're feeling about what we're thinking about, we begin to feel very powerful. This is a very timely podcast interview with Jamie. Jamie's interview was scheduled at the end of January 2020. This was before even the coronavirus had really taken hold in the Western Hemisphere. And um, of course, we are going to be talking about the outbreak. And we're also going to be talking about how we can deal with it in our minds. And it's just a wonderful conversation we had. So the beginning will be a little bit about Jamie and her story. And then we will be talking about, you know, the solutions that she's come up with for people to consider in dealing with this panic, this fear that is kind of around the world at the moment. Jamie has a wonderful integrative approach to well-being. So I hope you get something out of this interview. If nothing else, have a listen to our discussion around the whole coronavirus fear that's going on. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Jamie. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I am really looking forward to speaking to you today because I'm going to certainly, we're recording this in the middle of March 2020, in case people are wondering, and we're probably, probably not at the height yet, but probably in the midst of the biggest health concern, let's call it that way, that the planet has seen for a hundred years. And um, so I definitely want to touch on that with you today. But to begin with, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about your personal life. Um, so where were you born? A bit about your education and your transition in that. And then have you moved around? Um, I know you're from the USA, so where do you now live? And then we'll get into the, you know, your transition from education into business and your career and how we got, how you got to what you're doing today. Is that okay with you? That sounds great. Great. So over to you, Jamie. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I was born in um, Chicago, a suburb of Chicago. And I was born with a knowing, a true sense of who I came forth to become. Mm -hmm. And I think we all are. But fortunately, I grew up in a family where we had tremendous encouragement to explore our every curiosity and embark on each an incredible journey of self-discovery. Mm -hmm. And I threw myself into the mix of life with a sense of wild abandonment. Um, so I was certainly a handful growing up, and um, I grew up in um, the 70s, and it was really a wonderful time to um, be free and to experience life in kind of out on the rough and ragged edge. <laughs> Fortunately, um, my parents were wonderful in the sense of uh, allowing us to do all that. Right. And I always had the, um, the curiosity about interpersonal relationships and, mm. and people and how they interacted with one another. So I went on to, um, to study psychology. And right. um, I did that in the U.S. I finished um, in New York at Hofstra University and then went on to get my um, master's in social work and did a lot of um, internships in hospitals and psychiatric facilities. Right. Um, as a, as a young person, we were encouraged to travel a lot and we always did travel. So we really had a very good sense of the world as well as um, 
We grew up with a lot of international exchange students in our home. We grew up in a home that was always inviting others in to be part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And our parents always felt that the more we share, the more we had. And so that was a really nice way of, um, of growing up in, in my particular family, yeah. which I'm really uh, very appreciative of. So what else can I say about that? Um, so from, I won, yeah, oh, so, so you, you said you, you did a lot of work in, did you say psychiatric wards and things? <laughs> Uh, different facilities and, and hospitals, hospitals and that was yeah. part part of our of our training program mm -hmm. so I did a lot of psychotherapy with people right um, and uh, I have to say that although that was very interesting to me and that is what I ended up doing in a private practice it yes. never felt right right to me I was never a hundred percent comfortable with continuing to ask people to look back mm. in order to move forward forward mm. so um at a certain point i gave up that practice and i studied and i traveled more and then i came back around to doing what i do now which is very different so it was wow. definitely a journey <laughs> and and what made did you in your private psychotherapy practice did you have to give people medication as well no, I am not um, a doctor. Only a no. doctor can do that. And right. and I, it's interesting because I think as practitioners, we attract different kinds of people. Mm. And um, the majority of uh, people in my practice were, um, were not people that were in need of medication, which was, was really good. Yes. But I, yes. And, and how long did you do that for before you left doing that? Um, I had a private practice for about six years. Right. And, um, and then I really felt that it was time for me to shift gears. And um, why? I was able what, to do that. Why, uh, why did you feel you had to shift gears? What was it that caused you to decide to stop it? I think that when something doesn't resonate with us, that it kind of feels like someone or something is constantly tapping us on the shoulder. And, mm. and we're aware of that it's not the right fit. And I think over time, either we listen to ourselves or we ignore that. Mm. And then, of, of course, that, that feeling um, or that message gets louder and louder. And it was just enough for me to say, there'll never be a good time to do this, but this is the time for me to do it. So once I was in alignment with that choice, it was really, um, it was easy. It was, it was very clear to me that what I was really wanting to help people do is to assist themselves. And they can do that by just making a gentle shift. And I think that that can happen very easily and very gently. Mm. And we don't need to look backward in order for that to happen. So um, that's what I do now. I have an integrative approach to well-being. And that's really what I am, a, a well-being practitioner, assisting people in assisting themselves to get from where they are to where they want to be in a gentle and loving way. Yeah. And, and that feels right to me. When you got that gentle tap on the shoulder to say, you know, this isn't resonating, did you get the message straight away or did it take, you know, a couple of years before you got the message? Did you remember? I got the message straight away. And it's interesting because I have always been a person from as long as I can remember that is always and only listen to my own inner voice and inner knowing. Mm. Like I'm impossible to influence and um, I, I'm in, impossible 
to impress. Mm. <laughs> and so <laughs> that, that knowing was very familiar to me. Um, right. I, I got it, yeah, because you started off saying that you you felt like you had this knowing already in terms of your journey and right at the very early start and the direction that you had to go in. So I guess that's why I was kind of teasing you a little bit to find out whether, you know, you got it straight away because a lot of us actually don't get the message straight away. And we make a lot of mistakes on our journeys in business and our personal lives. And uh, and it can be very painful, you know, on the journey when you don't, only kind of years after you go, oh God, if I'd only listened to myself, if I'd only taken action when I had that inner feeling that something didn't feel right, if I'd only acted upon that. And yeah, which is, a shame, but it happens with us. <laughs> well, I think that um, when we can acknowledge that there have been those times when we have hurt ourselves and chosen or unconsciously chosen not to listen, it that it reinforces something really positive and important. It, it allows us to say, wow, I could have trusted myself. Mm. And then for the next time, maybe we can trust ourselves even by in that moment acknowledging this is something I know I could or should do and I'm choosing not to. Mm. That's mm. also very powerful. Mm. So. And yeah. so transitioning away from your psychotherapy practice, did you have a knowing what you were going to do next and how did that come about and what was it that you were doing next? I think for all the years that I was in my practice, that I was really unconsciously laying the foundation for this new integrative approach to well being. Mm -hmm. Because there were all these things that I was working on with clients. And within all of those moments where I was feeling a bit of contrast, I had launched all these new desires. So I think that it really unfolded beautifully and organically and naturally because of the experience of those particular years where I had been working with clients in such a way that it just was not resonating with me. Although I was able to help them to a certain point, I knew that there was so much more. Yes. And they were never really offered that opportunity or that possibility as a treatment modality. So, mm -hmm. um, that's when, you know, stepping away was really one of the best things I did for myself and for those clients. And did you go and study other things after that? I did. I stumbled across the work of Abraham Hicks, and I don't know if you know their work, but Very well. that, was really, yes. that was really inspiring to me and really was like... Um, uh, a language, as soon as I heard it, I felt like they were speaking to me. So that was really helpful. And, um, you know, I, a lot of my work is based in um, their work. Um, she is my mentor, my teacher. Um, I just, I love all of that mm. um, information that, you know, she shares and in, in such a loving and funny way, there is so much laughter. Yes, um, and <laughs> there is the yes. way she presents these options, and and so um, I gravitated toward that immediately, and that was really helpful. Brilliant, I I love it. So so apart from Abraham Hicks, is there anybody else that you followed and and studied with? I think that everyone that I would tap into, I got little pieces of information that resonated with me. So, and, and that's kind of what I encourage people to do in general. You know, if, if something appeals to you or resonates with you, you know, check it out. And if there's a little bit of it that makes sense to you, what someone is speaking to you about, you know, take that and go on to the next and to the next and to the next. Because yeah. I don't believe that there is the one. And I do believe that we know for ourselves, what would be beneficial when we 
intuitively guide ourselves to it and trust ourselves. Because it doesn't matter how we know or why we know. We do know for ourselves all the time. <laughs> it's really interesting you should say that because um, I've come across many teachers um, when I finally... I, I, when I finally, I thought when I finally woke up and realized there was something else to life other than what I was doing at the time and went on this journey of discovery. Um, and actually, it's something that you are passionate about and very knowledgeable about is the art of allowing. And I just allowed things to come my way and teachers to come towards me. and. Yeah, I learned a huge amount from many different teachers, but you're right that certain times throughout my life, some have been less important at that time, and I may have discovered somebody else that resonates to where I am today and that I might be focusing on. So very interesting that you say that you know what's good for you type of thing. That is certainly my belief. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so now you went on this journey, um, stopped the psychotherapy practice, went it, discovered Abraham Hicks and many other people that you tuned into to develop a different sort of practice, the integrative, integrated well-being kind of model. So tell us, a little bit of what, how does that show up for you on a day-to-day -day basis and how does that work and operate to give people an insight as to, to what you do today? Well, first of all, I believe that people are amazing and beautiful and filled with love and light and passion and joy and enthusiasm. Mm. And I also believe that we are intuitive knowers and that we um, have the ability to um, download infinite intelligence. So I think we can learn anything and we can have anything and that we are powerful manifestors. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that sometimes we get stuck and stuck is just a moment. And it only takes a moment to make a shift to a better feeling place. And that's what I'm really passionate about in terms of assisting people in the understanding that there are so many ways to get from where you are to where you want to be. And it is okay to tap into this forbidden word called desire <laughs> because mm -hmm. desire is really the jumping off point for everything. Um, and so that's really how I work with people. Um, first of all, to ask them to step into a place of self-empowerment and take some personal responsibility mm -hmm. for what they're wanting, even in terms of working with me. So um, that's not an option that we're given very often. Um, usually we are living in a society and meant to feel like we need to be victims and that we have no control over our circumstances and that um, that's, you know, just the way it is. And yes. I don't believe that to be the case at all. Mm. So what we do is we, we start creating these stories about our lives that maybe, you know, had something to do with our family of origin, maybe not. But as we go on to tell these stories over and over and over again, they are so filled with um, drama and trauma, and then we attract this big audience, and then we get rewarded for, you know, being a victim, and so on and so forth. So when we begin to kind of unpack all that and realize that, you know, um, our story is really up to us in terms of how we're choosing to live and what we're choosing to talk about to support how we're choosing to live. Um, and it's amazing when people buy into that notion, they really start to shift their lives very quickly and dramatically, and it feels a lot better. 
So um, that's kind of the beauty of the integrative approach to well-being. It's a really a feel-good process that's direct and very nurturing. And do you believe people get it almost immediately? I believe that people don't even believe it's an option. Mm. So when presented to people as an option, um, I think that it's something that either um, resonates with you or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any in between. Either it's like a hell yes or a hell no. Like, yes. Like, everything else I've been doing isn't working. You know, I, I want something different. And, and then when people step up and, and buy into this idea that they are in charge of their thoughts and feelings, because really we are the only ones that can think for ourselves. No one can think for us. No. Nobody can feel for us. And when we become conscious of what we're thinking about and how we're feeling about what we're thinking about, we begin to feel very powerful. So. I think that that self-empowerment gets addictive and it gets fun because it's kind of, um, that's what shifts our lives, how we're feeling moment to moment to moment. I, I, I agree with you 100%. And I know that people get, they get stuck don't they? And uh, excuse me one minute again. <clears throat> Some reason I've got a frog in my throat. I know that people get stuck in a certain rut, let's call it, you know, they get stuck in this groove, because they've been telling themselves something over and over and over and they've been conditioned to believe and they've created habits to believe uh, all the things that you've been saying. And I also agree with you, people can change it in a moment. But when things are so ingrained in that groove that they've been doing for years and years and years, how my my question would be, how quickly genuinely can they change to change that conditioning to a new condition and new habits that they start creating new, let's call it neurons or new grooves in their brain to, to go into a different direction? I often ask people if they are going to talk about something that happened to them from when they were younger or family of origin to begin to look at it from their right here and now adult perspective. Mm -hmm. Because when people are able to do that, it really changes the tone and the entire story because you're no longer young you're no longer small and vulnerable. You're an adult. So if people can begin to think about, whatever it is they've been conditioned to think about and ask themselves, first of all, is it even true? Mm -hmm. Is it true? I would say 90% of it is not true. And then can you look at that untruth from your right here and now adult perspective? I really do think it changes the lens and the tone and the feeling. That's a great start. Yeah. And I guess, go, go ahead. And then there are people that really want to argue for their limitations all day long. Yes. And I will never take that away from somebody because it's, it's yours. Like it's yours to have, to hold, to own, to change, to not change. Mm -hmm. And that's okay too. The, the question is, do you want to feel better? So maybe you're not going to change the situation, but you could definitely change how you feel about the situation by reframing it. Yes. 
And that's a choice. And there's no bad choice. There's no good choice. If someone says, I know I can change this by shifting my perspective and I'm choosing not to, that's really powerful. That's an amazing choice. And I applaud people for saying that. That's fantastic. (laughs) Because it is a conscious choice. It's very powerful. Mm. It, It would not be my choice for myself, but this whole idea of allowing... You know, when we are doing what's best for ourselves, we tend to extend that same courtesy to other people and allow other people to do whatever they need to do for themselves. We tend to really mind our own business because we are so invested in what we're doing for ourselves in such a way, and it's feeling so good that we really don't have the time to be distracted and judgmental about what other people are doing. Mm. It's fine what someone else is doing, and it's great what you're doing for yourself. Mm. And that's, that's I really think, the, the true meaning of the practice of allowing. Yeah. I, I remember the story that uh, we, I, I, you know, I can't find it anymore because we have so many um dvds with abraham hicks on it and but there's one that we watched some years ago where she talks about um getting into somebody else's pie and um, yes which is what you're describing <laughs> yes yes <laughs> and it's That's such exactly a right. hysterical <laughs> funny story um, and it's always stayed with us and when we feel that we're going into somebody's pie, we remind ourselves that it's their pie. It's got nothing to do with us. Um, yes. Just as a, you know, as an anchor <laughs> to try and shift your thinking or your judgment of others. Um, so, and, you know, what you're describing to me, I've got these two, two words that are flashing up in my brain with a little dash in between, and it's W-I-N dash W-I-N. It's a win-win. Um, it's definitely a win-win. Yes. Because you, the way you describe in saying if people want to hold on to their stuff, but they realize that's what they're doing, then that's great too. <laughs> so, so actually you're yes. helping people to win even though they might, you know, it may not be the perfect win, but they're still winning, <laughs> even if they are stuck yes. in some way. Yes. Yes. And and it's interesting. Maybe after that, they don't feel stuck. That's you know, right. They feel like yeah. it's a choice. And if it's a choice, you're really not stuck. No. You know, it's it, it's kind of like, you know, procrastination. And, mm. and she does talk a lot about procrastination. And procrastination is our friend because it gives us time to pause and get into alignment with the task at hand. Right. You know, so there's no resistance. And then you're almost happy to do it, Mm. you know? Mm. (laughs) Yeah. So it it does different ways Mm. to think about and talk about the same things. Yeah. I, I kind of sense that in some of the things you were saying, uh, you may be a fan of Byron Katie as well. Um, yes. And I, which is, again, it's that really, really tough thing of saying, well, is it true? You know, what you believe in, is it true? And the other thing that I love too is that who would you be without that thought? Um, and when you ask people that question, it's they have nowhere to go. <laughs> it's kind of... Not not in a, a negative way, but they then have that realization that if they didn't right. have that negative thought, let's call it a negative thought, although it isn't a negative thought, it's whatever thought is right for them. I get that now in what you're saying. Um, but even at the thought that's not serving them at that time, um, when they realize they're better off without it, <laughs> um, then the lights go up, um, go on in the, in the brain. Yeah. And Bruce Lipton's work is amazing. I mm. mean, if you're scientifically minded and you need that kind of, I mean, it's just 
fascinating. Yeah. So that that's another author that, you know, and a person I really respect all of the work mm, that, mm. that he presents. So Okay. So um let's let's tease some other thoughts out as well, but let's have a chat about the the current health kind of pandemic that's that's covering the world, the globe through a number of different ways, including the, I would call it media pandemic that is stressing everybody out and making people very, very worried and concerned. And so Jamie, what I'm sure you have been speaking to people about this or people have been coming to you to ask for help. And I'm not expecting a consultation session right now for everybody that's listening, but I, I'd love for you perhaps to share some of your insights and wisdom about what's going on and what's taking place and your assessment of it and how maybe share a few tips and ideas how people can, you know, get through this period of time because we know and you, you posted something on your Facebook page, which is all is well. But of course, that's not what people believe at the moment. So I think that this is an interesting time. And and I think that before even this um, coronavirus, we had all the politics, you know, it, it, that this has been brewing. And, and, and before that, we had the natural disasters. Yes. And it's just been one current event after another. And it's so interesting because the spin that um, the media has given the public is um, really not even given us a chance to come up for air. Mm. So I, I believe that this is real, and, and I do believe that um, it would be very helpful for people to turn off their television and to find a new source, National Public Radio, um, other sources that would report some facts in a non-emotional, hysterical way. Mm. Because I think we need to soothe ourselves back into our connection with ourselves so that we could be a little bit more emotionally intelligent as we're navigating this process and the procedures. And I think that's something that we are all capable of doing. Yes. So that's the first thing. And then... I think that within every situation of contrast, which is, this is a big one, there lies numerous opportunities. And I think that there is a lot of goodness coming out of people as a result of this. Coming Communities are coming together as they did during the fires in Australia and hurricanes and everything else. Yes. I believe that, um, that we are... In a, in a very unique situation that we are able to spend time with one another in a way that we maybe never have been before. You know, we have been excused from work. We have been excused from social obligation. We have been excused from so many things that have created our lives um, to be so busy. Yes. That we have neglected our um, personal connections with one another. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I think that there are many ways, positive ways to look at this as we're also becoming, you know, once again, emotionally intelligent and looking for the information delivered in a way that we can hear it and receive it and process it without freaking out about it. Mm. And, and unfortunately, <laughs> the, the, um, somebody said, I heard them saying that, you know, news channels 
are there to get our attention. And I I have this I have this word that I made up, which is letter A dot tension. T E N S I O N, which is a tension. It's creating tension in us and getting our attention. That's the basis of all movie making that takes place because in movies they need our attention, but in order to keep our attention, they've got to create tension. And it's like a double word, really attention and tension. The tension is within attention, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so creating that tension inside of us on just an ongoing basis. I mean, I did have to go to the supermarket this morning to just get a few little things, not to panic buy or anything like that. And indeed, I don't think that many people were panic buying. I think they've already done it. A lot of the shelves were empty. But there was a mother who obviously was taking her child to school and came into store to get a few things. And the mother was running down the aisles and the, and the small, her daughter was kind of running around calling out at her mother because she, the poor child was being, was so stressed by the situation of her mother running, you know, with, with stuff, um, that, children in, in our society are getting freaked out by it, um, which is very, very worrying. So the adults are freaking out and putting all of that stress into their children as well, which is really, really um, not great at all. So, but practically then, in terms of switching off the news media, people are going to be in fear of missing out. You know, people are in fear of missing out on social media. They're now, you know, okay, social media is still kind of also media, um, but the news media, it's, it's all part of the same media channels, isn't it? It's all over the place. It's coming at us it like It is. A and there's a lot of misreporting in social media, but it's so interesting because the social media that you put your attention on is will be the same television programming that you will watch. Mm. So it would really require a conscious shift in, first of all, what do you need for yourself? What do you want for yourself? Mm. Do you want to have a better understanding of the facts? Do you want to soothe yourself into connection so that you can be calm and caring for your children or your family? So it's about consciously asking yourself where you are with yourself and what you desire for yourself in this moment. It really comes back to those basic questions. And then based on that, making some conscious decisions mm. moment by moment, which feels better to have the television on, to have the television off, to be on social media where you're in a, a, a Facebook group that is just this feeding frenzy of fear or to shift to a different group where they're really talking about um, uh, uh, putting um, positive uh, spin on the helpful things that people are doing to kind of support each other during this time. And it's nice to, to know that you have all these options available to you. Right. At any moment, based on how do you feel and really which feels better. And it's interesting because people don't think they have an option right so the fact that you're saying there are there is another way there is another option for you to choose because we're so conditioned in believing we've got to you know be up to date with the latest news on it because how's it going to affect me or my family within the next literally 30 seconds <laughs> um yeah and so the, the other way to get around that would be to spend more time in nature, to go outside, to take a walk, to be, you know, in a more a natural world, a, mm. you know, a natural environment. So you will immediately be reminded if you allow yourself to, that all is as well. You know, mm. as soon as we leave our home and take a walk and 
you know, see things that are green and blooming. And I, I just think that we are able to take a big, deep breath and um, reassure ourselves mm. and all is well. In this moment, all is well. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. It's, it's a tough one for people to take on board, though, don't you think, Jamie? I think that it's challenging because for a lot of people, it goes against everything that they have been taught. But I think it's really interesting when we ask ourselves the beliefs that we're choosing for ourselves right now. I mean, what are our beliefs? I have beliefs. Where did they come from? Mm. Are those my beliefs? Or are those just beliefs from somewhere and someone else that I have taken on? And is this belief serving me? So it's a constant questioning of yourself, you know, not blindly just following, but really taking some time and asking yourself each and every moment, is this my belief? And can I create a new belief that will serve me in my right here and now? Mm. Right now, we're not talking about, you know, an hour from now, 10 minutes from now. So if I can turn off the TV right now and that feels better right now and I start to panic 10 minutes from now because I don't know what's going on and then I go turn the TV back on and then I know what's going on and then I ask myself again, which feels better? I can turn off the TV and then maybe over time I can trust myself that if there's something I need to know, I'll find out. Yeah. And I can spend more time feeling better than not. It's, it's really interesting because you're right. If you can get into the pattern or a new habit that says, I'm going to switch it off, then feel how that start feel, it will inevitably feel better. But for a short period of time, potentially, when maybe after a couple of hours you think, well, what is actually happening right now? So I'll give you a really good example. So I'm in the UK, you're in the USA. There are very different stories emerging in both countries, right? There's a different approach. Mm -hmm. I listen to some US podcasts, so I hear some of the stuff that is happening and isn't happening and testing and not testing, and it's ta taken a long time. And then airports have been closed and Europe is closed and the UK is open and Ireland is open and now the UK, all of these things are coming, coming at you, but none of them affect me, right? And then we're being told first thing this morning on the news media that there's going to be a report coming out today after they have what we call it here in our government, COBRA meeting, which is like an emergency type meeting. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be doing a daily news announcement, right? So you kind of you kind of sitting there. Oh, I have to admit that this morning I was thinking, well, I must switch the radio on. <clears throat> I wasn't watching TV. Do a bit of work. I'll have the radio in the background and find out when they're going to be coming out of this meeting and announcing the next range of, you know. I don't know, new procedures or conditions or lockdown or whatever it's called. And um, so after about an hour, I went, forget it. I can't, I really can't listen to this anymore because the, the story is just regurgitated over and over yes. and over yes. and over. There's no new information, but they're just serving yeah. up the information because a different person is saying the same message in a different way. And that they, they yes. get, so it just like got to me at one stage today and I switched on my Spotify and I have some meditation music on there. Oh, and beautiful. I just switched that on and my, it was like the balloon just got emptied, you know, it was like, oh, and I took the yeah. dog for a walk and it's beautiful. We have a beautiful sunny day in the UK here. And it was like, Yay. and everything you've just said, I did today. <laughs> and you're 100% right. It felt so much better to just disconnect from it. And 
and have the the confidence because I never used to watch TV for years and then I got back to it again. And why? I don't know. But I, I remember because I was in Florida many, many years ago because I had an apartment in Florida and I was staying there over Christmas one year and I wasn't listening to the TV, the news or anything. It was beautiful weather in December. It was just gorgeous there. And around the 27th of December, like three days later, I learned by accident that the tsunami had happened on, on, on I don't know, Christmas Eve or something, I think it was, or Boxing Day or something. But I, I learned about it like three days after it had happened. And I missed all the, the craziness that happened with the news breaking and stuff. But my reaction to it was totally different. I yes. Didn't, yes. Because I hadn't heard it live, happening live. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It happened. Yes. So I wasn't there when it broke, but I, I learned about it like three days later. Um, and it's back to, I'm only giving this as an example, not to kind of show off how good was I then. No, 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 it's no, no, just no, to no. Say, no, 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 no. It doesn't no, affect... But the yeah, it affected me differently. Yes, and, and because it affected you differently, you are probably much more available to assist yourself and other people yes. through whatever the chaos that mm. others were experiencing. Mm. So the other thing is read the newspaper if you need the information. It is uh, a non-emotional delivery of information. Great it allows idea. you to assimilate the information that you are believing that you need in such a way that you're not going to be so reacted or reactive about it. You won't be emotionally charged from mm. it. And mm. I think that that is really helpful in kind of remaining calm and taking care of yourself. You know, at this time, we really need self-care. So that we can care for others. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and in fact I I I didn't in when the years ago when the tsunami happened, I wasn't doing anything like blogging or writing or anything in those days. And I, I wrote uh, a piece because three days later after the tsunami had happened there was a huge outpouring of the world supporting the nations that were affected and some really fantastic help was taking place and there was a huge amount of compassion around the world for the people that were affected and I called this little piece that I wrote, I must have it somewhere, um, the title of it was A Wave of Compassion. So the tsunami nice. wave I felt was like a wave of compassion rather than anything else, you know. And so taking it back right to the early point you mentioned, which is, you know, there's an opportunity for people to get closer during this crisis. I, when I walk the dog, and I don't see this very often, you see people on the streets and they're getting in their cars and they're driving off and, um, um, I saw t at, at two houses, and I never see this, people speaking to each other, you know, checking in with each other, saying, are you okay? Do you need anything? Or can I help you at all? Or having a conversation about the, the frenzy or something else, you know. But I saw people speaking to each other, and I never see that on the street, you know. People are in their own houses, in their own cars. They don't talk to each other. Um so yeah, some something inevitably. Yes, there are bad things happening, which is people are passing to the other side, and maybe before their time, and that is horrible for the family. And I'm saying specifically the family because the person that's passed over, they're potentially in a better place. Um, yes, because they they were already potentially quite ill, you know. So. It might actually have been a blessing because a lot of the people that are getting this and not recovering 
are because they've got underlying health conditions that they've been suffering with for many years. So, um, so that is really not great at all for the families that are left without those loved ones. And at the same time, I also believe people definitely will get closer together. Yes, I do too. I also think that the biggest pandemic is fear. Mm, yeah. That is more powerful than the coronavirus or any other virus we have ever had or yeah. illness we've ever had. And it's important that each and every person take it upon themselves to manage their own fear. Because otherwise, you are contributing to the chaos. Mm. Do you have so, any tips apart from the ones you've already mentioned? Do you have any other ideas for, for managing fear? You, you know, and I think listening to music, walking your dog, doing things that connect you to yourself. Mm. What connects you to you? And for each person, it's different. You know, do some yoga, do some meditation, read a book. Now we have in all the museums in the U.S., they have online free tours. They're offering online free opera. I mean, it's just amazing what's come of this, mm. how quickly, too, it's come of it, where there's all these alternative things that people can put their attention on, mm. good feeling things. And I think all of that good feeling contributes to mass consciousness, which really will help this pandemic dissipate quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any view on or insights how long this is going to be around for? You know, I believe that the recommendations of people, you know, doing self-quarantine and isolating and, and staying out of large crowds of people, I think that that will slow this down and hopefully slow it down to give, um, you know, researchers a chance to come up with um, a better course of treatment yeah. and um, a vaccine. And I think that in many ways, this is similar to the flu. Unfortunately, the way it came out of China, the way the information was delivered, I think that's what caused the panic mm. and paranoia. Yeah. So, you know, they've said over and over and over again, more people have died from the flu than will die from the coronavirus. I know. I mean, that's a fact. Yeah. That's a fact. However, we are in such a frenzy and we are so panicked that we've got to get a grip on ourselves. We really need to. And that's, we have a social responsibility to do that. Mm. I think that's a good way of saying it. And I also, I totally agree with you. The other thing, whilst we're in this panic and fear, we know that that lowers the immune system, right? Yes, it does. Which yes, means, does. which means we are more susceptible to getting other illnesses <laughs> that aren't even related to the coronavirus. Um, plus, our immune system is low. Therefore, if it does get into your system, your symptoms may be worse because your body is more acidic. Um, and can't deal with it as quickly because actually people are recovering from this very, very quickly. You know, people that are healthy yes. and well, they're recovering within days, not weeks, it's days. Yes. Um, yes. So, and, and that's not just hearsay, it's actually, I've listened to people say no, that. No, that's research. Know? Yeah. No, that's, that's what the research is showing. Yeah. So how can you manage your thoughts? Because no one else can do that for you. And however you individually figure out to, how to do that for yourself, please spend more time managing your thoughts. Mm. Not other people's thoughts, your own, your own thoughts. Moment by moment. This is a moment by moment process. 
And it's, yeah, it is because other people are filling your mind with their thoughts. That's what you're saying. And it's, I guess you've got to choose, you know, your own thoughts and feelings around things. And I suppose just be quiet for a few minutes and just, just process them. Yes, allow it to come to you, mm. really, so that you can be tuned into you. You don't need to be tuned into others. Be tuned into you. Mm. When you're connected to yourself, you're much more available to receive others and to be there for others unconditionally. Very interesting, Jamie. Yeah. I, I really <laughs> appreciate you spending a f you know, few minutes talking about this because it's it definitely, without a doubt, is is the most important thing that's going on in the world at the moment. And it's very interesting to observe how everybody's reacting to it, but also to observe how I'm reacting to it, you know, and, and seeing, you know, taking of recognizing the feeling inside of myself and then taking action to change something. <laughs> um, yeah. Which only literally, and it's just by chance that I'm speaking to you today, but literally only just happened today. Because in previous days, I had the radio on all day long listening to what was going on. And only today I went, that's enough. I've had it. <laughs> And, you know, once again, that's an amazing choice that people can make for themselves. Like if you are going to tune in all day long to the radio, to the TV, at least acknowledge it's a conscious choice. You're not a victim to the media. You're not a victim to the press. You're not a victim to anything. You're choosing to do it. Mm -hmm. And so step up, take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. And that's a powerful choice. That's a choice, a conscious choice. Yes. So, and then you can make another choice based on, you know, which feels better or not. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but it's because we you know there's been some, <laughs> I'm sorry, there's been so many great, funny things that have come out of this in terms of like jokes and the thing about toilet paper and mm -hmm. just, you know, so there is a side of this where there's been good, good humor that have come out, come out of it. And, you know, I would say, put your attention there because there is a lot of things to laugh about. Yes. You know? Um, yeah. So laughing feels good. Feels very good, Jamie. Thank you so much. And, um, could you share with our listeners where they can learn more about you or if they need some help, how they can get in touch with you? Yes, I have a website. It's www.jamie-lernr.com. And there's lots of interesting and very um, cheerful information on my website. And it's a lovely option. Great, and that's the best place for them to to, yes. to get in yes, touch with is. you. Fantastic, it is. Okay, well, I'll that's in the show notes as well, so people can can choose to to get in touch with you. And I love the conscious decision making process. That's really sounds the most powerful thing that you've certainly taught me today. And I'm sure the listeners will get something out of it. And my aim is to get this episode out as quickly as possible um, within the next 24 hours so people can start uh, putting into practice some of the wonderful advice that you've given us today, Jamie. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you for inviting me. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 